Well, good morning. How are y'all? Good to see you, and Happy New Year. I hope your uh, 2016 is off to a great start. And uh, thank you for being here today, especially for starting your new year off at church, uh, particularly here at Wynwood. If you brought your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Genesis uh, chapter 13. Uh, today, we are going to start um, a new four-week talk or, or series on decisions that break us. Uh, in February, we'll talk about four keys that uh, or four things every, every believer should do if they want to have a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I knew uh, starting this year, I had talked throughout December, I want 2016 to be a year that we grow in our faith as a church more than we ever have before. And as part of that, I hope many of you have started your Read Your Bible Through the Year uh, this year challenge. If not, you've got like 350 days left to catch up. So there's still plenty of time. Just don't delay in getting started. But on Sunday mornings, I knew in the first few months, I wanted us to talk about topics that would kind of challenge us in our view of how we're going to develop our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I knew I wanted to spend a couple weeks on bad decisions we make that hinder our growth, and then a couple weeks on things we do that help our growth. But I couldn't figure out which one I wanted to start with, and I talked to our staff, and we were just split down the middle. Two of us thought you start with the bad decisions. Two of them thought, no, start with the good things we can do. And, and what I settled on is we start with the decisions that we make that hinder our faith. And here's why. We can't outgrow bad decisions. Now, it, it, we, we've experienced this in other areas of our lives. You can't out-earn bad spending habits. You can't out-exercise bad eating habits. And in our faith, I think there are certain decisions we make that it doesn't matter how many positive things we do, if we continue to do certain things, we're never going to reach our growth potential. So for the first four weeks in January, we're going to look at decisions that we sometimes make as believers that will always slow down our growth. Because if we really want to grow, it's not just about adding things into our life or into our spiritual routine. We've got to make sure we eliminate certain things that slow down our growth process. So we're going to have a series on decisions that break us. And today, we look at Lot in Genesis chapter 13. And we see how he took some steps towards sin. Because sometimes in our own life as believers, we fail to make good decisions. And in doing so, we walk closer into sinful habits and behaviors. And we can't do that if we're serious about growing our faith. You know, in college, I worked for the physical plant. Now, how Oklahoma Baptist University worked is they would hire professionals to help maintain the campus, maintain the grounds, and then they would supplement students like myself to do the really nasty labor. You know, we've all had one of those jobs that they pay a young person to do as they wait to get the job they really want. This was one of mine. As a college student, we just kind of showed up, and we worked with whoever needed the help that day. So some days I carried the bag. Uh, for the electrician. Um, some days we, uh, we weed eated or we push mode for the grounds department. On one particular day, uh, we showed up, and as students, a lot of us had morning classes, so about four or five of us showed up for the, the one o'clock shift, which, is, which was the, the shift that started after lunch. And we get there, and the foreman of the whole plant has a sour look on his face. And he says, all right, all you guys are going to go with the painter today. Okay, I had, I had never worked. With the painter, and we get we get into the painter's kind of cubby at the plant at work, and he said, "Okay, what happened was they had sent like the soccer team in to paint a hallway in the boys' dorm, but they hadn't laid down any drop cloths or taped anything else at all. So there was white paint all over the floor covering that they called carpet in the boys' dorm, and he said, "You all got to go clean that up." I'm like, okay. He said, I'm going to give you all a bucket of lacquer thinner and a bunch of rags and scrapers. you got to get all that paint up because we can't afford to replace the carpet right now. And so I thought, this is going to be a crummy day at the office. So we take our lacquer thinner, we take our rags, we take our scraper, and he hands us this bag of masks. And he said, you boys have to wear these masks. Those fumes are really, really strong. 
And I thought, I'm, I'm not one of these Tulsa suburb boys. I'm from Fayette County, America. I don't need a mask to, to take up a little dry paint. But we get there, and, and we're on our hands and knees, and we're using the lacquer thinner, and all those fumes are blowing right back into our face. No masks on. This was in college. Remember that as the story unfolds. College, 10 years ago. We're breathing in all these fumes, and about five minutes into it, I thought, this isn't so bad. About 10 minutes into it, I think, I really like my job. <laughs> About 20 minutes into it, we are all sitting on the floor laughing. I don't remember what we were laughing at, but it was really funny to us at the time. And a little while longer, I remember walking out, getting away from the fumes, fresh air, and all of a sudden, I felt like I had been hit by a freight train. And we all went back to the break room and were down in Mountain Dew and eating the Snickers, hoping to get relief from the headache and the, just the crummy feeling we got as we left the giddy feeling of breathing in those fumes. And it's all because I wouldn't wear a mask. And you know, our spiritual life gets to be like that sometimes. That we fail to take some simple precautions and make some simple decisions and we end up in a sinful behavior that costs us more than we were willing to pay and hurts more than we were ever willing to go through. All because we wouldn't take some decisions that would prevent us from going there. Lot made some decisions that put him in the close vicinity of sinful behaviors, and we will see today how much it cost him, because it was more than he was ever willing to pay. And as believers, if we don't make decisions to prevent sin, we're going to end up stepping into it. So as we look at Lot's story, Lot stepped towards sin. And as we look at that, we'll see what he did, and then we'll also talk about the fix in our life so we know how to prevent the same pattern that Lot went through. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead, and we're going to read Genesis 13, verses 8 uh, through, through 13 as well. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for today and, and all you've done uh, in our lives as a church this past year and, and all the exciting times that we've, we've had. God, I just ask that as we look towards this year that you would, um, you would grow us as a church in our faith and it would deepen and strengthen and our commitment to you would grow. Um, God, as we do that, I pray that as individuals we would, we would do our part um, to lean into you and to, to uh, center our lives on you and your plan for us. And God, as we look at this story today, just point out in all of our lives the way that we're, uh, we're putting ourselves close to, uh, to temptation and close to sinful behaviors so that we'll know how to uh, take a step back from those and that we won't be endangering our spiritual lives, but we'll make decisions to help ourselves be more spiritually successful. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So like I said in our entry, Lot made some decisions that were actually taking a step towards his own spiritual harm. We don't want to repeat those mistakes. And one of the first things that Lot did is he left encouraging relationships. He left relationships, he left a relationship with Abraham, his uncle, that encouraged his spiritual growth and his faith. Now, Lot and his uncle both were in agriculture, both herdsmen, probably sheep, but the text doesn't specifically say, but based on that culture, logical that sheep, maybe a few other livestock as well. Now, when our story starts, they're still living 
in the same, same vicinity. They're together with all their, their servants and all their farmhands as well as all their crops. Now in this day, uh, the, the herds, they would be led by their, by their masters or their herdsmen throughout different portions of the land that they lived in to make sure that one area never got depleted. Now as they moved about, Abraham and Lot, they both got just worked and blessed their, their, their finances, and he did that through growing their herds and then growing the number of men that it took for, for them to manage all that God had given them. And over time, the two of them together became too much for one area to share. And the result was that the servants of Abraham and the servants of Lot, they began to butt heads over, over the provisions, and they began to have strife. Uh, in over who would get what portion to eat or to drink and on down the line. Abraham, in his wisdom, said, this isn't going to end well. This is, this is not healthy. So he brings Lot in. He says, Lot, look, we've both grown. God's blessed our, our herds. They've grown. We can't share the same area anymore. So you pick where you want to go, and I'll go the other way. Because Lot valued the relationship, and he realized if they tried to maintain the same area, it was only going to get worse. So in his wisdom, he said, Lot, we've got to separate. So you pick which direction you want to go, and you and your herd will go that way. Abraham said, I'll, I'll go the other way. It's my commitment to you. Now, I realize there's a lot going on here. And it's, I, I, it's not as simple as Lot took his toys and left. But what we can't deny is that when Lot left the physical presence of Abraham, he left an encouraging influence on his life. That when, that, when they separated their physical relationship, where they lived together in close vicinity, it took Lot further away from someone who had a big impact on his spiritual life. And we've got to make sure that's a mistake we don't repeat in our own life. I don't know that it could have worked for Lot and Abraham to still share the same land. But I do know the impact of being away from Abraham really damaged Lot's future. So in our life, we've got to make sure we build a support system that, that builds up our faith. If the mistake is Lot left an encouraging relationship, then the cue to us means we've got to surround ourselves with believers who impact our faith in the positive direction. And I think there's two different types of people we need in our spiritual corner. First are companions. We just need Christian friends. People that believe the same things that we do. People that want the same things out of life that we do. People who hold our values in common. <clears throat> now, I don't think that every time we get around these friends, we need to have deep spiritual or theological conversations. Sometimes we just need a Christian friend to go eat fajitas with and talk about the Chiefs game. But we've got to have people around us who hold their values in common with ours. You know, I think there's just a law of humanity that you become like the people you spend time with. We've all enforced that law with humanity as we've advised our children or our grandchildren or other young people we care about. Because if someone we love was starting to run around with a crowd that we knew was going to be damaging towards them, we knew they would be next. So we'd advise them against that. We've got to make sure as mature adults, we don't isolate ourselves from Christian influences by not leaning into a support system. We've got to have companions around us who encourage our faith. Sometimes we'll lean on them directly and we will have those conversations and they will be there. Sometimes it'll be just that our friends hold the same value system. But we've got to have companions. We also have to have a coach. We all need a spiritual coach. Now, I have coached one team in my life. I coached four-year-old soccer when Eli played up for soccer at Maryville. Now, you may say that's not much of a coaching career, but that is harder than any coaching job on the planet to try to teach four-year-olds how to play soccer. 
Uh, and so I've not been much of a coach. I'm also was never much of an athlete. But having been around sports and watching them being a fan, I think there's a few characteristics of a good basketball coach or a football coach that are true of a good spiritual coach. One, they'll push us where we need to be pushed, and they won't accept less than our personal best. As believers, we need someone who will prod us along and who we'll receive that from. We need someone who will say, you know, you're doing this in your life, and you need to stop. It's not going to serve you well in the future. Or, or you're doing this so well, keep at it. We need that spiritual coach to push us along. To say, hey, you're not giving it your best here. You may think you are, but I know you can do better. And then challenge us and encourage us and show us how to do better. I think the second thing a spiritual coach does is they're always our biggest fan. A good spiritual coach, even when we get it wrong, says, hey, you did your best. We're going to do better next time. Let's get moving again. It's another reason why we need some, a coach in our lives is because we all need a fan. We need a cheerleader. We need someone who encourages us when we don't get it right and helps us do better in the future or just cheers us on when we're doing well in our spiritual life. So when we look to build our support system so we don't leave encouraging relationships, we got to find companions and we also got to find a spiritual coach. Both are totally and equally necessary in our spiritual lives. The second thing Lot did that we can't duplicate, he focused on the immediate appeal. Uh, let's read again verses uh, 10, through, 10 through 11, where it's written, And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. So Lot chose for himself all, the va all of the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. So a couple things going on here is that as Lot chose his land, he looked out and he saw the Jordan Valley. Now that's where Sodom and Gomorrah is, which is a city God will eventually destroy, which is part of what cost Lot so much in his life. But Lot looked out, and even though there was sin in that area, and great sin in that area, he just saw a great place to raise a farm. He saw, saw an area that was water like the garden of the Lord, meaning it looked fantastic. It had probably great grass for them to feed on, water supply, looked to be a habitable area for him and his, and his, his servants. He said, this is great. Yeah, there's an issue over here, but we can get past that. All he saw was what meet the eye. He failed to look down at the long-term impact that living that close to Sodom and Gomorrah would have on his life. And I think there's a couple realities is that when Lot looked out, one, when he looked out towards the area that looked so good, Sodom and Gomorrah was there, one, I think that the sinful condition was already there. It was already in place. The patterns that would eventually lead God to destroy the city were already there. And second, I don't think that was hidden from Lot. I think he knew or at least had access to the knowledge of what danger he was putting himself in. And in our lives, often we can forecast where sin is coming. And what we've got to do is look past the immediate appeal of the moment to what is the best thing for me spiritually long term. Uh, so if, if Lot's mistake was he looked at the immediate appeal, our fix is we've got to focus on God's best for us long term. One thing I believe about sin is the sin we are tempted by is always appealing to us. Now there are sins out there that will never appeal to me. I will never be tempted by them. But the things that to where Satan's got got my number on, those things look fun to me. But they're only fun for a moment. But in that moment, that's all we see. And we've got to be able to look past that in our spiritual lives. We've got to discipline ourselves to where we don't say, hey, this, this, the appeal right here is worth the long-term damage. Or what we see and what's appealing in a moment clouds the reality that we know we'll face down the road. 
Lot looked out and all he saw was great grass and water and a fantastic place to, raise, to, to grow his herd. He didn't realize how damaging that would be in the future, even though he should have been able to forecast that. So in our own lives, we've got to look at what is God's best for us long term and look past that. Sin is always appealing when we're in the heat of the moment. Sometimes sin may even seem logical. Sometimes we're faced with the decision and we say, well, if I don't do this, there's going to be this huge impact down the road. Maybe it's a financial implication or a relationship deal. But we've got to look past the immediate decision or the immediate temptation or appeal and say, but that's not God's best for me. That's what Lot failed to do. And we don't want to replicate that bad decision in our own lives. The third thing that Lot did that cost him so greatly is he wanted to see how close he could get to sin. Let's reread 12 through 13 where it's written. Abraham settled in the land of Canaan where, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. So there's a couple things that, I, that, that jump out of the page or, or two lines from that passage I want us to see. One is that Sodom was characterized as great sinners against the Lord or greatly wicked against the Lord. Now, every city's got its challenges and its sinful behavior in it. But in America, when we think of great cities or great cities that are just characterized by sin, we may think of a Las Vegas or a New Orleans or Chicago with all the violence issues they have. We don't think of a Birmingham or an Indianapolis or a Knoxville. See, the sin was so great in Sodom that, that it was noted that they were great sinners. It was so great that God would eventually destroy the whole city out of his anger, which is not a reaction we get from God very often. So Lot moved himself into an area to where they were characterized as great sinners against the Lord. But the text also says he moved as far as. And to me that says he wanted to see how close he could get before it destroyed him. He wanted to say, well, there's the line of sin. How close can I get before I topple over? And I've had so many conversations with believers who are wanting to see how close they can get to sin before it reaches up and grabs them and takes them down. I've sat with people on purity issues. And, and can I have dinner on a business trip with someone who's not my spouse. Well, why would you want to see how close you can get to an affair? How much do I have to give before I'm disobedient? Well, that's not the right question. You know, I've sat with people and, and, and I had one, one person approach me and say, is it still gossip if we talk bad about people with a family member? Yes. But we've got an inclination. It's, it's like we want to see how close we can get to a temptation or to a sin before it like, reaches up and gets us by the ankle and drags us in instead of seeing how many steps we can take back from a sinful pattern to make sure we steer clear of it. As we traveled as a, as a kid, and I'm still this way to some extent, I had no regard for those safety barriers when we would stop at scenic outlooks. I remember being at the Grand Canyon and climbing underneath one, trying to see how close I could get to the edge. My mom's freaking out in the back. My dad's saying, well, we'll just have another if he falls over. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the attitude we, we try to take with sin sometimes. We want to see how close we can get before we completely fall into it. It's what Lot did. He moved as far as the great wickedness against the Lord. Why? Because it was appealing. What, what helped him get there? He left someone who would have advised him against that. These are mistakes that we don't have to make in our own lives. And if we read the rest of Lot's story, we would see how much it cost him 
At one point, he'll be captive. He'll be taken captive by enemies of Sodom. Abraham will have to come rescue him. Didn't have to be like that. He'll have to flee from the city when God destroys it. But in that process, God will take the life of his wife. Cost him one of the most important relationships he had. And from there, as we look at the rest of it unpacked, his home life will become warped in such a way that today's society couldn't even replicate it. It cost him, his decisions cost him more than he was ever willing to pay. But it didn't have to be like that. Sin will always cost us more than we want to pay. And the challenge for us is not to make decisions that take us closer to it, but to make, us, to make decisions that keep us far away from sin. To make sure we surround ourselves with other believers who are going to support our faith and encourage that. To make sure we, we look past the appeal of a moment into what's God's best for us long term. And to make sure we don't see how close we can get to a temptation before we fall on in. You know, Lot's story is challenging. Part of the reason it's challenging is because we all find ourselves there from time to time. But the great news is, is it doesn't have to be like that. But the key is, is if we don't take some of the steps that we talked about today, well, we can't outgrow our sinful decisions. We can't outpray or can't outread our Bible if we won't make sure we're protecting ourselves against sin in our own lives. That doesn't mean we don't fall. It doesn't mean we don't get tripped up. But something I've seen many believers do over and over again is they keep walking into sin hoping to outgrow or overcompensate that decision. And it doesn't work like that. If we're serious about growing our faith, if this is going to be a year that we grow as individuals, we've got to learn from Lot's story and make sure we're not continuing to walk in to sinful behaviors. You know, in just a moment, we're going to have a time to respond. Um, Pastor Don's going to come up and lead us in a song of worship. Um, this is just a chance for you to deal with the Lord on anything He may be saying in your lives. Every week during this time, I stand down here. I'd love to talk with you or pray with you, uh, but you can also pray right where you're at. You can grab a friend, and uh, they'd be glad to discuss whatever God's doing in your life as well. So I'll pray, and then Don, he'll come on up and lead. Lord, we thank you so much for today. and for all you're teaching us and all that you're doing in our lives as individuals and as in our lives as a church. Just be with us as we uh, uh, go through this time of response. Help us to be obedient to anything you may be saying or doing in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen.